So, hi, uh, my name is Teodor Dima. I am a developer at East Vision Systems, a company from Romania. And we do a lot of things there, but we mainly concern ourselves with ad tech, big, big data, video technologies, and real time bidding. For those that do not know what that, mean, uh, that really means, uh, this means that we must handle a lot of user events every second, which must be continuously persisted into the database. So what is an event? Simply put, an event is represented by a simple GET request, which uh, is sent by a user from a browser which views advertising. And that is sent to the event processing system uh, that must analyze the data and then push it into the database. The amount of data that can be generated by a single user is quite big. A single user viewing uh, a single ad can see, uh, can send about at least about uh, 10 events of data. These events are not sent all at the same time, which means that the user must, must uh, uh, keep a continuous uh, connection with the server. And that means that you have a lot of users which send a lot of events uh, from a lot of concurrent clients. This problem has been seen long before this talk. It is called C10K. Uh, and it basically means how can you handle 10,000 concurrent connections on the same machine? During my time in the company, we had aver averages of about 12 million requests per minute. That means about 200,000 requests per second that must be handled by a single server cluster. So the question is, how can you handle such a traffic? And moreover, how can you handle such a traffic by using as little resources as possible? So the naive solution would be to implement uh, a system that responds to each request and sends it directly to the, to the database. Uh, this works for a small amount of data and is quite easy and fast to implement, but uh, it's ultimately unmaintainable and uh, consumes a lot of resources. Another alternative solution would be to use uh, the Apache Trio, Kafka, Storm, or, and Zookeeper or some alternatives to that. Uh, however, if you want to configure and to tune uh, these systems uh, as good as you can uh, into a coherent whole, that takes time, and it's uh, often non-Pythonic. Uh, although some, some work has been put to make it a lot more Pythonic by the ones at, by the people at Parsley. So kudos to them. Initially, when we had to implement such a system, uh, we had to ship it. And that meant that we implemented a simple solution, the naive one, uh, which handled streams of, of, of events and then simply sent them to the database. Uh, in order to check for data consist consistency though, in order to be sure that we haven't dropped any event that reached the server but was not inserted into the database, we checked the access logs of the web server and we checked if that data corresponds with the data from the database because all the data that you need, all the events are there in the access log. So this led to a simple idea. Why not use the access log as a simple queue for an event processing system? The idea was that when the requests reach the machine, they are received by our system by the Nginx web server. The Nginx web server solves the C10K problem, so that would solve a lot of problems. So between the access logs and the database, there had to be another service which would take the data, analyze it, transform it, and then push it into the database. So we be began to think about the implementations of such a project uh, and if it would be resilient and feasible enough for us to do it. After some prototypes and some new ideas, we came up with a clean structure, and we came up with, with a service that we uh, called LogBunker. Uh, now, this is a data flow diagram, which shows a simplified schema of the data flow through a single virtual machine in the cloud. As I said, a single uh, HTML request is sent by the user, by a browser, uh, through a load balancer, and then to the Nginx web server. In order, in order to ensure that the data was easily swappable between the virtual machines, we used uh, the Amazon Web Server's EBS, Elastic Block, uh, Block Store service, uh, to sort the access log data. Then the access log was read by our service, by LogBunker, and then it is absorbed into the database. 
Inside of the log bunker service, there are actually three processes that work at the same time. So, two of these processes are the parser and the absurder. The parser reads the access log continuously, just like a tail, a Unix tail, and then analyzes these events and caches them into an internal cache structure. This internal cache structure is using the Python standard types. They're actually quite beautiful to use and very simple to use. Uh, after it has cached this data for a fixed period of seconds, configurable of course, it then takes this data and pushes it into a multiprocessing queue that makes the connection with the absurder. Uh, the absurder then pops the queue, takes the data from that, and then pushes it into the database. Besides pushing it into the database, the absurder actually logs into a special file, into a, we call it the bin log file. Uh, every event that it, it has actually pushed into the database and with the offset of the access log. So that in the event of a crash, in the event that you, you actually want to reboot the system, to restart it, the service will then know uh, which point was the last point that was introduced into the database and could restart from that point on. The third and the final process is the admin process. This process checks periodically if the other two processes are active. If they are not, it shuts down the whole system. Now, why did we do that? Why didn't we just reboot the whole service? Well, there is a tiny probability that if you have something that can crash a process, that can crash the data processing service, then you may have corrupt data. If you have data that does not reach the database, but it is there somewhere in the system, then that's bad. But if you insert corrupt data into the database, then that's really much worse. So we try to avoid that at all costs. Uh, another function of the administration process is, is to have sync the data files, the access file and the bin log file. Uh, the fsync function is a function which synchronizes the virtual memory of a file with the actual disk content of that file, which means that the file is persisted after you make the fsync call. That is extremely important if you, have, if you want data persistence. And the last important function is to serve status data at a configurable port. Uh, that was done with a single simple protocol. It just um, accepts every single request that comes and then serves the JSON status data. This status data is uh, collected from the other two processes through some shared virtual memory uh, that is controlled by a multiprocessing lock, uh, a simple read-write lock. So one of the first issues that we thought about was how stable would the service be when it tails the access log? So turns out it's very easy and completely stable. It's very easy to implement, but there is one teensy tiny problem. The offsets are hard to calculate efficiently, and like I said, we need those offsets to uh, put them in the bin log file. So, so uh, in order to do that, uh, using buffered text files is almost useless because if you use buffered text files, you cannot know the exact offset of a single line of text. Unbuffered text files are really slow and could not help us. So it's actually easier to open the file in byte mode, just read a number of bytes, add the number of bytes that are contained in a lie, and there you go, you have the offset. So between the parser and the absorber process, we have a multiprocessing queue. The queue is using a pipe in the background, a Unix pipe, which, uh, and that pipe never corrupted data. We never had problems with it but there is a problem with the data transfer speed because when you actually insert some data into the queue, it actually spawns a thread which then inserts the data gradually from the buffer, its internal buffer, into the pipe. If this thread does not have the gill, you are going, going to have data in the buffer which is not actually inserted in the pipe. So the connection between the parser and the absorber is broken. There are ways to minimize the damages, and I will talk about them in a later slide. Um, so how could a catastrophic crash be handled securely and efficiently? Where if that happens, if you have a catastrophic crash, 
Then there are two files, essential files, which can be corrupted or incomplete, the access log and the bin log. And you can manage that somewhat by just F-syncing them as often as you can. So then if you restart uh, the machine or, or if you have a crash, then you can recover the data. You can just go on and then insert the data that you have there. Okay, so is Python fast enough to ingest this data? Well, yes, actually with some performance optimizations, CPython could get about 20,000 requests per second on the same machine on a C4X large uh, Amazon Web Service virtual machine. That means that you have uh, this processing power on a machine with four virtual cores and eight gigabytes of RAM. However, after we inserted it into production, we re-implemented the data processing system in CIPA. Uh, that was quite easy to do. It just took a week, excluding testing, uh, and without any prior CIPAN experience, and it's doubled the performance. So CIPAN, way to go. Um, there is another problem, though. Uh, like I said, we called F-Sync on the two uh, essential data files. Uh, and we use the network file storage offered by AWS. The F-Sync does affect the performance of the read from, from the files. And we had a problem at some point that uh, periodically, once every two days or so, the network lagged in the Amazon Web Service. And that meant that the F-Sync call took uh, from beneath 0 0.1 seconds to almost 25 seconds, which meant that the, the service bo was blocked at that time. But it was actually pretty rare, and it did not uh, affect the system too much. So during one of the testing phases, we observed a strange behavior with the absurder. Uh, the parser was reading continuously from the access log file. It cached data happily. Um, the cache was full. Uh, and the absorber was not having the same efficiency as it would have under normal conditions. So what, what happened there was that the parser process, the parser thread was starving, the feeder thread was starving the thread that would actually, that had the purpose of taking the data and then insert it into the pipe. The only way we could manage until now to, uh, to avoid this problem was to force the parser thread to sleep periodically. It could not be fully fixed, and it just solved our problem uh, right then. So how can you maintain, uh, how easy is to maintain such a system? A single machine that answers to this amount of requests, like I said, 20,000 20, requests per second, contains only two essential processes, the Nginx service, which takes the requests and just needs a configuration file. And the Python daemon, LogBunker, which also needs a single configuration file. Those machines are small. They only contain four cores and they are quite cheap. They are commodity hardware. And they, you can serve uh, with a server cluster 12 million requests per minute by just using 15 virtual machines. That means that there is no single point of failure. When you have machines that are this small, uh, you have enough processing power to obtain such, uh, such an improvement. And uh, if you lose a machine, then the system will not be affected as much as, let's say, if you lose a gigantic 32 cores virtual machine with God knows how many gigabytes of RAM. Uh, Another thing to say about maintenance is that these machines are not throttled to 100%. These machines are throttled at a maximum of 50% in a normal situation, and let's say 75% on peaks. This reduces the possibility of low av availability and hardware failure, because if you throttle a machine at, at 100%, then you will have some hardware failures. Uh, and even if the peaks reach 100% of system capacity, then you have a queue, you have an event queue that is represented by the access log file. Uh, that access log file will just uh, keep be appended to by the Nginx web server. The Nginx web server will happily continue to serve the requests. And if the uh, Python process does not, uh, does not, cannot uh, pace with the Nginx web server, 
uh, it doesn't really have to. Uh, it will have a delay from, uh, from the point when the data uh, uh, reaches the virtual machine uh, to when it is inserted into the database by about, let's say, a couple of minutes, but it will, it will not be critical. You will never lose data. You will just continue pushing it into the database when the bit is gone. S and the same thing applies to the database connection. The database um, can actually lag quite much. And uh, if you have, at some point in time, some problems with the database, let's say that you have a cluster of database servers and one of them or several of them crash, then you will have less right uh, performance on them. And if the database connection lags, then the absurder will just lag in uh, getting the data from the queue. But th what that means is that th the data will actually uh, add itself into the cache. The cache will just add the data more and more and more. Uh, and after the database is restored to its full power, it will just continue to insert it into the database and it will just uh, reach its 100%. Okay, so that was it. Thank you for your attention. If there are questions, please. Hi. Um, one question, well actually I have uh, probably two, but the first one is why between your parser and your uh, upsetter you don't uh, use RabbitMQ or any message queuing, like I don't know, zero MQ even would solve your problem of queue of, um, that you have in the multiprocessing. Uh, between the parser and the upsetter? Yeah. Well, firstly because it was easier to implement and because it uh, did not affect the performance as much as we thought. So even if uh, even with uh, that uh, performance penalty, we still reached 20,000 requests per second. 20,000 requests, uh, the limit of the Nginx uh, web server in an Amazon uh, C4X large instance is about 22, 24 re requests per second. And we did not reach that limit. And like I said, we kept our servers to serve about 12,000 requests per second so that we kept low the possibility of hardware failure. So we could have uh, implemented a message queuing service. We thought about implementing something with Redis. Uh, and we may implement that in the future. We don't know. But for now, it's sitting quite, quite good. Well, just zero MQ is uh, five lines, and it solves your problem. That's it. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, um, I just want to ask about, uh, you talked about how even if uh, your log bunker uh, process crashes or doesn't work, you're not going to lose any logs because they're stored in the access log. And yes. you have a different Nginx on each virtual machine. So yes. if you have a virtual machine crash or go down, what happens to the log messages that are in the access log on that machine which have yet to be stored in your database? So they're gone? They're not gone forever because they are kept in the access log and that access log will uh, be kept on the ABS uh, network partition. So what that means is that temporarily, while the virtual machine is down and you cannot uh, have access to the EBS network partition, you will have some data that does not reach the database. But if your uh, support team is ready, then it will reconnect that EBS system to another log bunker instance, maybe, or another uh, tool and just reinsert it. Thanks. You had a second question. Um, why are you not using things like logstash or equivalent to do your parsing? Uh, logstash between what uh, components? Well, basically to parse your logs. Uh, what you do manually by re-implementing what those utilities do is just pick up the information directly from the log via dedicated utilities. I mean, there are many already existing solutions to do that precise job, I think. I mean, I'm not expert in logstash, but I've heard many things about logging and log parsing and whatnot. 
And to me, it seems that Logstash or something equivalent would be a very good solution to extract information, meaningful information from your logs because it's a structured information and probably you can inform Logstash um, to read how to read text, basically. So that means that we'll have a cluster of servers which have the Nginx on each one of the machines and... Uh, but it's the same thing, it's just you, uh, you read your access log somehow and just instead of re-implementing something in Python, you use a standard uh, utility that is well maintained by professionals. Yes, but that means that it will be redirected to another cluster of servers which uh, actually has Logstash on them, right? Well, you can install, I guess, Logstash on the ma same machines as where you run your log bunker. Uh, Yes, that is true. Uh, however, I am not. I'm not really sure how is the performance on on those services. Uh, we actually could implement this uh, really quickly and had a really good performance. And we thought that we could use this. So I don't know. Ultimately, I don't know how the performance would be. Thank you. Any other questions? One more question. Okay, thank you, Teodor.